Oh yes, this is gonna be good. Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and today I'm delighted to be talking about one of the most enjoyable episodes of Murder, She Wrote, Who Killed J.B. Fletcher from Season 7. Even though this is from a later season, I give you permission to watch this one no matter where you are in the show. This is essential Murder, She Wrote watching. If you've seen all the episodes and are now looking for ones to revisit, definitely put this at the top of your list. It's a very silly episode filled with delightful characters, funny dialogue, questionable southern accents, and cults. Oh. Oh. The premise is just wonderful. Jess's identity is, quote, stolen by someone, and that someone gets arrested and then murdered, leading to a lot of public confusion and frustration for Jess, who is not dead. We start out with a fairly innocent scene. It looks like a bedazzled Jess is signing an autograph for this man with a loud tie. But wait. Always glad to accommodate my public. <gasps> I am shook. I am shook, and I know they revealed this in the intro, but I am shook, and I'm not sure what I'm shaken about. Maybe it's the outfit, or the fact that somebody thinks this is how Jess dresses. I can't look away now. There's so much in this still. Earrings or earballs? Is this a badge for winning the ugliest jacket contest? And also, isn't Jess's picture always on the back of her books? Is this guy just as dense as a pound cake? Thanks again for everything. My pleasure. Bye. Oh my god, the back of the jacket. This woman is a legend. Actress Jane Withers actually is a legend who did have a flair for the flashy fashion. Check that alliteration. Here's a picture of her later in life wearing the same jacket. Fake Jessica is on the case and she uses her thief class skills to pick a lock. Look, I hate to be that woman, but this isn't a lock you can do this with. Trust me, I'm an expert at lock picking in video games. She proceeds to pilfer some classified documents but is caught by mustache cop. Hold it right there, ma'am. She spends a night in jail under Jess's name, though her real name is Marge. Her friend Kit asks her what the hell she was doing. What Jessica would be doing, cracking the case. Wow, you've heard of copycat killers, right? This is the opposite. This is a copycat detective. I just find this so incredibly unbelievable. Understand that at this stage in the Murder, She Wrote mythos, Jess is an extremely popular writer, a household name. Jessica Fletcher is one of the preeminent mystery writers of the United States. It's like if somebody was trying to impersonate Stephen King. Imagine that happening. She confronts a woman who works for Macaulay Kennels, believing she is exposing a scandal that involves cheating at dog shows. Unfortunately, she was barking up the wrong tree. I know this is a very serious thingy and poor Marge is about to be axed, but can we see that reaction just one more time? Our lovely protagonist, Jessica Fletcher, is getting ready to travel home from a book signing when she sees she's been arrested for breaking into a kennel. Jessica calls the sheriff of Bremerton, where Marge was arrested. To no one's surprise, the sheriff is trash. Look, ma'am, if you're going for one of those split personality defenses, that's strictly between you and your lawyer, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I'm looking at my notes here, and all I wrote for this is DICK in all caps. He doesn't believe her, so Jess decides to go to Bremerton herself to prove it. He asks for a driver's license. Jess doesn't drive, but she shows him her ID card, to which he says the person they arrested had the same one. She proceeds to offer even more identification in the form of credit cards and other documents. <clears throat> Let me tell you, she, she's just paper. I mean, this doesn't prove anything. What do you mean it's just paper? It proves a lot of things. This guy is just the worst, and honestly, his hair is outdated, so there. Jess, being the smart woman she is, grabs a book from the store across the street to prove her identity. You see? It's me. Clever girl. I love her expression and gestures here. It just cracks me up. The sheriff agrees to change the arrest record, but Jess still wants to find the person who impersonated her. Perhaps you could tell me who bailed her out. Perhaps you could stop wasting my time. Oh no, he did not. Just gives him a look, and he tells her who bailed Marge out. That's the power of J.B. Fletcher. She can convince with only a look. Jess goes to the address she was given, finds Kit, and walks into something truly horrifying. J.B. Fletcher in the flesh! Oh my god, I don't believe it. <laughs> Miss Fletcher, wear your biggest oh, yeah. <laughs> It's a J.B. Fletcher cult. Jessica's, Jessica's life. Jessica's love. Jessica, Jessica will lead us to freedom. The ladies show her in and to the table. Now let us all hold hands and start the seance. Jess is confused and asks what all this is about. Well, this is the weekly meeting of the J.B. Fletcher Literary Society. <laughs> the portrait. <laughs> 
Jess explains she's not there for the meeting, but to find Marge. Kit confesses to the group that Marge had been arrested and used the ID. Then Jess asks them to get rid of all of the fake IDs. You see, they're such big fans that sometimes they like to pretend to solve mysteries. So one of the ladies printed out fake IDs. Yeah, that's normal. Jess visits Marge's home, but she isn't there. She checks the paper and sees something even worse. Oh no! This is like being on the internet and coming across one of those fake celebrity death tabloids. <laughs> like, Jeff Goldblum is still alive, right? Jess reads that Marge lost control of her car and crashed it and was likely found with the fake ID. After talking to Kit, Jess says they should go to the Macaulay house since she was investigating them. I'll take you. Oh, I'll, take you. I'll be happy, happy, happy to drive you to We're about two degrees away from misery. Jess and Kit get to the house only to crash a funeral. They're told that Simon Macaulay, one of the kennel owners, was killed in a hunting accident. That's not the weird part. The weird part is they're blaming a dog for knocking over his gun and killing him. That's Mitchell Lawrence, the insurance agent. We have a homeowner's policy with him. They have a brief conversation with the insurance agent responsible for Macaulay's life insurance policy. Then Kit tries to blend into the wall to do some totally discreet snooping. Mrs. Macaulay. It's McCurley, actually. Jess asks the wife of the deceased and the kennel's co-owner if she knew about Marge's death and if she had stopped by to talk to her. She tells Jess that nobody stopped by and implies that she doesn't know and has never seen Marge. Jess then asks if she has any idea of why Marge would want to break into their kennel. No, there was nothing valuable in the office, just paperwork. And we all know how the town sheriff feels about that. Let me tell you, she, she's just paper. The brawny man also makes an appearance. He talks to Kid and Jess just a little bit outside, and they find one of the kennel's trained dogs with him. Jess asks if he's a hunter. Well, in my spare time, I'm with the highway patrol. I hunt people. I'm just waiting for somebody at this club to, like, light the sacrificial candles. <laughs> Jess tells the group that she is certain Lisa McCauley had seen Marge because when Jess questioned her, she said, probably just some old gray-haired wacko. But how would Mrs. McCauley know the color of her hair if she hadn't seen her or met her? What's interesting about this is that we, the audience, didn't really need to know this because we got to witness this take place early in the episode, which is kind of rare for Murder, She Wrote. Showing incriminating scenes to the viewer more directly like this is more of a Columbo MO. Most of the evidence like this happens off screen, so I just thought that was an interesting change of direction. Jess wants to find more evidence to prove Marge had been a victim of murder, and the ladies of the club are enthusiastic to use their connections to assist. Well, Jessica, we, we can help you investigate. Great. I actually really enjoy this gossipy lady club. It's like an alternate universe version of the ladies of Loretta's beauty shop back in Jess's hometown of Cabot Cove. Jess tries to convince the sheriff to help her with Marge's alleged murder, and he is not too receptive to the idea. Meanwhile, whoa, what is this lamp? Anyway, Jess's credit card has been cancelled because she is still considered dead. It occurs to her that she needs to call her hometown to tell everyone she's alive. She tells her friend Seth to find a way to spread the word. Well, I'll make it easy on yourself. Just go tell the girls down at Loretta's Beauty Parlor. And there it is. Perfect reference. Jess borrows a dog from... someone? To get access into the kennel. Whose dog is this? One of the ladies finds an important clue. Using her connections to the coroner's office, she is able to copy a police report. Kit exclaims that Marge could not have been driving because her glasses were in her purse when she was found and she cannot drive without them. Brawny Man seems to get suspicious about the ladies meeting and interrupts. The topic of Simon's death comes back up and just presses him on this whole dog thing. It seemed mighty odd to me that a dog could knock over a gun and cause it to fire. Oh, you never know what a dog might do. Especially if you've trained him right. You know, he's not wrong. There actually was an episode from season one that featured a dog that was trained to, quote, murder someone. I wonder if this was a little nod to that episode or if it was just a coincidence. I just can't help but think Jess is sitting there thinking, you'll never believe this, but I've seen this before. Jess is now thinking that the deaths of Simon McCauley and Marge could be linked. She secretly reads Simon's autopsy report and says the injury and the way he was positioned when he was found do not match up. And this just irritates Sheriff McDick even further. When Jess and Kit go to the kennel to pick up someone's dog, they find some hanky-panky going on. Jess makes her presence and her terrible southern accent known. Yoo-hoo! Anybody home? The sheriff actually admits that her theory about Simon's death was right after speaking to the coroner, and now he's on her side. He says the current suspects for the murder are Rick, the naughty dog groomer, and Lisa McCauley, the sexy siren of the kennel. Both Rick and Lisa claimed to have been home alone when McCauley was killed. Wait, hang on. Home alone? Macaulay. Home alone. 
Macaulay. Home alone when Macaulay was killed. Don't mind me, I'm just gonna sit here and extrapolate way too much from this sentence. Back at the J.B. Fletcher Literary Society, the women work hard to get new evidence, including just outright stealing blood records and passwords. As a side note, I am getting major Hocus Pocus vibes from this woman's aesthetic. Oh wow, this computer setup is... sad. I just want to reach out and, and help it. The ladies learned that Simon Macaulay's insurance policy was bumped up to $2 million just a few months ago, so they believe wholeheartedly that Lisa Macaulay bumped him off for the money and so she could get with the naughty dog groomer. We got us a moti. <laughs> I think Jess's expression says everything I was thinking. Jessica informs the sheriff and he takes it all on board. You go, girls! He goes to interrogate Lisa McCauley and sees bad boy Rick, naughty Daryl Hall-like dog groomer, peeling out of her driveway. So... this woman is dead? Oh. Nice negligee. Wow, this is now a triple murder. Impressive. Unfortunately, this throws everything out of whack. Everyone was banking on Lisa being the murderer, and now she's dead, and Rick is on the lam. I love saying that for some reason. On the lam. This all comes down to a light bulb moment. A literal light bulb moment. While searching Macaulay's basement, Jess notices a spot on one of the light bulbs. When they turn it off, aha! blood. It confirms Simon was killed in the basement, shockingly not by a dog. Now we also have to figure out Lisa's death. They find Rick and press him, but he insists it wasn't him. He said he found her dead, got scared, and left. Someone at the kennel confirms that he was there at Lisa's time of death. Jesus, we're running out of suspects. I'm ashamed to say it, but I almost forgot about Marge. You and me both, girl. There's so many things going on in this episode. The ladies try to figure out how Marge was tied to these two other murders. They speculate that she saw something or someone she shouldn't have. Hmm, maybe it was this figure with blood-soaked hands from earlier in the episode. <laughs> Jess asks for help from Jane, who works at the blood bank. She requested to see some donor records, and bam, it's the Jessica Fletcher epiphany moment. It's this guy, the insurance agent. Remember this? We have a homeowner's policy with him. It seems so superfluous at the time. Who just says this so randomly? But now we know why. We got some cheeky foreshadowing. This is a simple case of fraud. Lisa signed the paperwork as her husband and agreed to split the life insurance money with the agent if he made sure to get rid of him. That's the motive. But the true evidence comes down to blood type. This guy posed as Simon McCauley for the life insurance exam. He gave his blood, which showed up as A positive on the record, but we found out earlier that Simon's blood type was B negative. He killed Lisa because one million dollars just wasn't enough. Wham bam, thank you ma'am. He also staged Marge's death. When she went to expose Lisa for this alleged dog cheating scandal, she had walked in on the death of Simon, so this asshat killed her. He didn't even know her. He thought she knew about the murder, and that's why she was there. He tries to then murder Jessica, but Sheriff Grumpy Pants had already taken his gun. Jess has outdone herself this time. She has solved three murders in a town she's not even familiar with, all while being dead. Oh no! Incredible. Actually, the real hero in all this is me. I am the hero. Thank you. Okay, final thoughts. Because I pretty much gave my opinions on this episode as I was explaining it, I don't have too much to add, but I do want to say that I adored it. There's a reason a lot of fans and show enthusiasts list this as necessary viewing. It's star-studded, featuring actresses like Janet Blair, Margaret O'Brien, and Betty Garrett. The plot is very fun, especially Jess's ongoing stolen identity problem. I love this weird little fan club, even though it's veering into parasocial hell, and it's dense in a good, uncomplicated way. If you've been watching my show for a while, you know there have been some very convoluted episodes of Murder, She Wrote. Even though there's a lot packed into this one, I could still follow it. It's the perfect little cozy as well, and if you're not familiar, a cozy is a type of murder mystery. You can always identify it by its focus on characters instead of actual evidence or police procedure. This one focuses on the collaborative efforts of the J.B. Fletcher Literary Society and their desire to help their idol. Though some evidence was shown early on, the key clues came in at the end of the episode. Cozies also tend to have some lighthearted moments, even humor, because like I said, there's less emphasis on the murders. They come across as less tragic than they would in real life. I hope you'll give this episode a watch. I think any murder mystery fan would enjoy it. And until next time, happy sleuthing. 
everyone, thanks for watching my video on this wonderful episode of Murder, She Wrote. If you're dying for more, I do have plenty to show you, but first I want to give a big shout out to all of my patrons who support this channel. If you're interested in becoming a patron of Murder, She Wrote breakdown videos, do consider pledging a little bit, but if not, something very effective you can do is like and leave a comment. If you were looking for more love letters to this show, here's a few more breakdowns I did. On the left, we have the very first Murder, She Wrote episode I did a couple years ago. It's even zanier than this episode. And on the right is the latest video I did just before this one. I do hope you enjoy them, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.